So, liebe Gäste, ihr Gäste, cher invité, beste Gäste, these are four languages of the four supporting entities here. Welcome to this German house. This German house consists of the German Consulate General and the permanent mission of Germany um, to the United Nations. We have this house since about 20 years, just as an explanation, that you know the, where we are tonight. It is a great pleasure to have you here today to host the officially called Collaboration Across Borders Salon, financially supported and sponsored by the German Consulate General in New York and organized by the Human Impact Institute. We have been a long time in contact with Tara Deporte over there, whom all, mostly I think all of you or most of you already know. Um, to make this not only a German event, but most desirably a US-European event. We are glad that finally we succeeded to include also other consulates general and other entities in this event. In this event. I would like to extend a especially warm welcome to all supporters and side sponsors of this saloon, to name them, which is uh, my colleague Eric Bayer from the French the Consulate General, the Deputy Consul General, and Vincent Jeshu, Head of the Development Department of the French Mission to the United Nations. The French Consulate provided, for example, the wine we are drinking tonight, and uh, the silicon glasses which we have are not really in style, but my French, French colleagues, they told me it's important what's in the glass or in the silicon, <laughs> not, uh, not what's in the, is the frame. Yeah. So we have to rely on them because they are experts on that. Um, I also greet Carter Graf of the Consulate General of the Netherlands, and I also greet the EU Permanent Mission uh, to the United Nations. I don't know whether somebody of this EU Permanent Mission is here or not. I have not seen anybody, apparently it's not it, but the important is that they are, oh, you are here! So I was, I was just about to say the important is that you sponsor the event, yeah, but we are, you also very welcome. And I also greet a very warm welcome goes to Karina Gore, who is director of the Center for Earth Ethics. Another welcome goes, goes to the performing artists, Lemon Gour and Angel Nefis, and the panelists, Lyle, jo Lyle Johnston, Donald Baird, 
Jacqueline Patterson, and our colleague from the German Embassy in Washington, Anton Hufnagel. Last but not least, I would send a special big thanks to my colleague Julian, or Julian Jans, who has done a great job in the past few weeks to organize this event for the German Consulate General, and he put many, many hours and hours in this event. Originally, as you have noticed, we had notici notified that Mrs. Ségolène Royal, who is the French ambassador for the Arctic and the Arctic Poles, and who is a real celebrity in European politics, president of COP21 and former minister of ecology, sustainable development, energy in France, uh, would speak here tonight. Unfortunately, uh, during her stay in New York, she had to um, travel home earlier than already than it was planned due to family reasons. But she sends her very best regards to the crowd tonight here, and we are very sorry for that. We would have loved to have her here as an outstanding example of French, German, and European um, unity in this very important aspect. So the question is, why do we think this is the right time for this event tonight, in December, early December? Not even three weeks ago, the UN Climate Change Conference COP23 in Bonn, Germany, took place. Participants focused on how to maintain momentum two years after the adoption of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in the context of the recent announcement by the United States to withdraw from this agreement. The delegations expressed a renewed sense of urgency and the need for greater ambition to tackle climate change and several new climate action initiatives. Commitment and partnerships were announced. COP23 will be followed by a series of summits and conferences on climate change. The UN Climate Summit in September 2019, the COP24 in Poland in December 2018, and now very close to today is the One Planet Summit to be convened by France in Paris next week on December 12th. We are today right between two landmark events. I am sure I don't have to convince anybody here in this room that we have to meet the challenges caused by climate change, or, or is there anybody who is not convinced? Please hands up. <laughs> so why do we this? Yeah. Despite, uh, normally those people don't attend uh, uh, salons like that, yeah, which is regrettable, but we have to accept it. Um, despite the U.S. President's admi administration's announcement of the U.S. With withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, we all have to keep up with making progress, negotiating and implementing, and we see strong signals. Um, that many entities and even states in the US still perceive climate change as a serious threat. The COP23 in Bonn sent a powerful signal that the world is united and will not be hindered in its climate action efforts. Therefore, speaking for all today's supporters, we find it very important to uphold or even increase the awareness what could happen if we do, not, if we do nothing against climate change. Tonight, we will see art and panel discussions. But we start right now with a world premiere of the film Think Like a Kid, a video that features cool kids from New York. When, when recording the video, I was personally there, so I know that, I was really stunned how much those kids between 7 and 11 years know and sometimes are worried, worried about climate change much more than, more than most adults. You will see that right now. <coughs> After the event tonight, there is a small reception with drinks and food. We will continue networking and having fun. And, but now, finally, I would like to thank Tara De Porte and the Human Impact Institute for organizing this event. Without her commitment and her creativity, this event would not have been possible. It was very hard work for many of her friends and colleagues who contributed that it can place take today. Tara will moderate the salon from now on. So Tara, Thank now you. it's yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, um, first before we start the, the video that you all came here for, our, our real climate heroes here, although there are many of them, you adults are okay too. I wanted to let you know, um, we will be checking in questions through social media platforms, so if you just use the hashtag Human Impacts Institute, if you comment on Twitter or Facebook or send a selfie on Instagram, which you might have to do later, I don't know, 
teaser. Um, use that hashtag and we'll be checking on that. And then, um, because a view tonight has been a little tricky, I'm going to have to do an unelegant move of unplugging something I realized that's plugged into the wrong machine, and then we'll start the video. <laughs> Can I 
turning to it. There we go. So we like to start these salons um, just really, really briefly. As an organization, the Human Impacts Institute, we're really excited about how we use inspiration as a tool to really get people excited about taking environmental action. And so, so much about what we do is really pairing with cultural experts, like so many people in the room, that know how to get the hair to stand up on our arms and to get us to jump out of our seats because we can't wait to go to that performance or to see the next episode or to hear the next song that just really moves us. So, we've been really working a lot on pairing those amazing communicators with people that are experts in the solutions around climate change and other environmental issues. And so tonight, with our salons, we'd like to... <clears throat> I think you already have a little bit of inspiration from our VIP kids here, but we'd like to start off the evening with a performance. And I'm, I'm very excited to present Lemon Guac.
was a handout that was on your seat. It included working with climate scientists to think about how to visualize climate data. The last unelegant thing, and could I, uh, in terms of switching the cord, and could I ask our wonderful panelists, you know who you are, to come join me up here on the stage. One more round of applause for the and you do have to turn it on a couple seconds before you're ready to speak to let you know. So, we have a lot of amazing people up here, and I'm really honored that all of you could make it tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I think one of the... Uh, oops, sorry, I have, to, I have to now pull this up. I'm from the Black Charcoal Street Division of the Dene people, also incorrectly known as Navajo. Mm -hmm. um, happy to be here. Um, I've always had trouble uh, articulating my title. Um, I do a lot of things and I have a lot of irons and a lot of fire. <laughs> But I think the best way to articulate it is that I'm a servant of the Creator, and I'm a sister of all humanity, and I'm a child of the Earth, and I also happen to be an original Caretakers Fellow at the Center for Earth Ethics, directed my, by my dear sister, Karina Gore, um, among other things. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. from the uh, Urban Ethics Development Committee. Happy to be here tonight. Um, I have to apologize to Lila uh, very quickly because I uh, wrote an email to colleagues in Germany explaining about the Bear Ears, Bears Ears National Monument today, and I possibly uh, inadvertently characterized one of the tribes our job managing that monument as a map of a data I don't know. Um, this is actually my, oh, this is my, uh, my second time in New York. Uh, I was here during my first career in 
investment banker with a, uh, a major uh, a US bank uh, 10 years ago, um, I decided to do something else with my life. At some point, uh, went back to, to uni, studied philosophy, um, and then ended up with the environmental ministry in Germany, uh, where we're focusing on our nuclear phase for the last uh, three years. And I'm now in Washington, uh, focusing very much on climate policy, our engagement with uh, still the federal government, but uh, more and more uh, subnational and non-state actors on, on climate. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. So my name is Jackie Patterson. I was born in Chicago, in South Side. And to, uh, my mom came up to Chicago through the Great Migration from Mississippi, and my dad came up from Jamaica, um, West Indies. And so uh, my, my work has taken me from being a special educator to a public health, um, working on, a public health person working on in, infectious diseases to a uh, women's rights advocate to an uh, economic justice advocate, and now working with the NAACP as the director of the Environmental and Climate Justice Program where I do a lot of work with frontline communities who are facing injustice around environmental um, hazards, and also working with communities on preparing to being resilient to the impacts of climate change. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Karana Gore, and I was born in Nashville in 1973. Um, my family is from Nashville, Virginia, Kentucky area on both sides. I live in New York City now with my three kids, and I work at the Center for Earth Ethics, which is based at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, I got a degree from Union um, in 2013 and started to work there just afterwards uh, in a public programming job, and we did a big conference called Religions for the Earth, and the Center for Earth Ethics grew out of that. And I just want to acknowledge um, that there are some members of our board of advisors from the Center for Earth Ethics here, really happy, um, and also some members of our staff. So that's where I work, and really honored to be on this program with everyone here tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, you're just glad to know that I don't have to be vulnerable anymore. I found my notes. <laughs> Although I'll start like that. Um, so, one of the things, I, I put up a, a question that I feel like many people in the room would have um, similar responses to. We said, what are the root causes of climate change? Um, and I have a feeling we, we talk about pollution and climate change and things like that, because, but we're thinking about this whole conversation as the idea of collaboration across borders. So I really wanted to start with some of um, the things that were very important to each of you to talk about. And Lila, I'd love to really start with you, because when we had initially um, chatted about this topic, you had really taken us to the source about looking at the whole concept of borders. Can you start us off? Um, sure. All right, so um, as a Diné woman, um, you're kind of born into a certain way of seeing things. Um, perhaps I'm, I might be biased, but a more accurate way of seeing things, where you start to realize that uh, America doesn't really exist. Um, it's actually an idea. It's an abstract idea that is, it, it, it makes us feel like it's real because it has symbols like a flag. It has a currency that has a lot of emblematic um, things on it like um, certain presidents, uh, certain buildings. Um, and they also have different symbols, uh, like, like national anthems and things like that, to try and make this imaginary thing real, when it never really will be. Um, and I think as an indigenous person, um, you can't help but see how these borders were drawn in very um, inappropriate ways by um, empirical or empire and, and colonization. So I like to really question those borders and their legitimacy 
um, because indigenous peoples of this continent have been here for many hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we have a very different way of looking at the earth in the sense that we understand you cannot own it. Um, as the famous ancestors have said, the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth. And really seeing that um, America was named after Amerigo Vespucci, who, if you do a little bit of research, was actually looking for slaves and gold. Um, so not only are the borders illegitimate, but the whole name to describe this abstract concept is, um, has its roots in, in very inappropriate uh, human behavior, which we have the capacity to change and to redefine. And so I think it's been really good to remember, or rather to never forget, that nation states are, aren't really real. The only place they exist is in our heads. And I think when we dissolve those borders in our minds, we start to understand that um, there's, there's larger, more real borders out there, such as the border that the Rocky Mountains create and the biomes that flourish because of those mountains, such as the border between the Sonoran Desert and as you get more south into the Yucatan uh, jungle areas, and that these um, ecologically defined borders are, are much more real. And so the last thing I'll say is that um, in the old days and still today, the people would name themselves after the land. For instance, the people of the White Rock, the people of the Middle River, the people of the Aguaje Palm, the people of the Jaguar, etc. And it was very strange to indigenous peoples when Westerners came and started to, instead of naming themselves after the land, they started naming the land after themselves. <laughs> Washington, Louisville, Georgia, so it was like, what are you doing? Um, to, to draw these imaginary borders really ignores the very beautiful ecological realities that create more sensible borders um, and define, used to define nations of people much more, much more deeply. So, um, yeah, I think it's, thank you for starting off with that because I think it's good to, to challenge the borders that we, that we live by and, and to question them and to hopefully one day um, redefine them for all of humanity's sake. Yeah, thank you. We talk about how, but yet, yet still, the same folks who are 
who are the, 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 the ones who are burning fossil fuels in our communities and causing harms to our health are also trying to hoodwink communities that are, that are often um, made vulnerable by the political and economic reality, and therefore they are vulnerable to the, the hijinks of these, of these companies that try to, to feel, fool them into thinking that they're working for their interests. And so we actually put together this contest called Don't Believe the Fossil Fuel Hype, where we're really um, engaging with youth who are, who are so creative in, in telling stories, as we've seen earlier, to be able to, to really do parodies on the ploys that these fossil fuel companies use to co op our communities. So we thought it would be interesting to kind of, again, from the mouths of babes, because they really are, um, are, are quite prolific in their ways. And so we, we, we were excited about um, having that as kind of a rallying cry. Like the, these kids can see the ironies of how these companies are taking advantage, and it really is the kids' future that are being impacted by it. So, really, you know, having the kid provide leadership for folks who might not necessarily be able to see the ways that they're being um, taken advantage. And kind of falling off of that, of, of this idea of, the, of hype and coming back to the like, root cause of climate change, it was something that both Brianna and Anton touched on a little bit. Anton, you had touched on a bit of this idea of you know, Germany's been going through this energy transformation um, of really going towards renewables, and that particularly in the DC environment right now, there's a lot of bashing and talking about that's why we have, if you're wondering why there's a dinosaur and an old-fashioned pump over there, um, you know, this idea that, you know, the only way to money up there is through the extraction of fossil fuels. And, and you had commented on that um, being a falsehood. Can you, can you uh, comment a little bit of that? And just, just I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can interpret that photo on the right as well. Sure, I will interrupt that photo in a minute. Um, Can you please respond to the question while doing that position? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Try. Um, but I want to react to something that, that Lila said, because uh, one of those symbols that she mentioned, those, those the three real symbols, one of them is on my, on my business card. It's the, uh, the German Eagle Lark, our national, uh, national, web, uh, national, uh, national symbol. Um, Can you have the mic? Sure. And in, in Europe, for a long time, we, we assigned a lot of significance to, to these symbols. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, in, in 1917, uh, my grandfather lost a leg uh, fighting for, for one of those symbols uh, in, in the trenches um, on, on the French territory. Um, if I would have told him that I would be going to Paris not to, to fight as a, as, a, as a victor, but as a as a student for, for two years, he would have thought I was uh, completely crazy and unreasonable. Um, it took us 100 years in, in Europe to figure out a way to limit each other and collaborate across these borders. Um, but I think the, the, the completely unforeseen successes we've made there um, are the ones we need in, in this fight against climate change. Right? And a lot of people are telling us, well, this is completely out of out of question that we will transition to renewables uh, from a world that is still almost entirely dependent on fossil fuels. Um, I think in you know in European history in one century we've shown that you can accomplish uh, what is what has been thought to be impossible and still and still uh, and you know maybe that is a, maybe that is an inspiration for for some of the the achievements and the like, humongous steps we, we need. Um, in this battle that's, that's living in the 21st century, and that our chance would call uh, the key challenge for humanity in our speech in, in Bonn uh, three weeks ago. Um, I was actually born in a, in a different country. I was born in, in communist East Germany. Um, and it, during my, my first year in school, uh, we used to sing a song about draining the swamp. Uh, this was, it was actually a, it was a song about actual draining of actual swamps. <laughs> So with a very different attitude towards the environment, um, we still believe that the environment was our enemy and that uh, economic progress um, and eventually the, the victory of Altariot would depend on, on draining actual swamps. Um, I think we've seen a change there. I, we stopped singing that song very early in the 1990s after reunification um, because there had been a, a much more successful environmental movement in, in democratic Germany. Um, 
But I think you know the, the root causes of climate change, uh, of course, are um, the, the kind of vision of, of progress, the vision of economic prosperity that we've had for um, almost 200 years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and now it's upon us to to, to make that change. About this, I I, I feel like kind of. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> and maybe we, we're truly uh, draining the swamp now with the Me Too campaign um, and movement going on. Maybe you can clap for that. <laughs> um, so, and Karina, so I'll, I'll let you continue with these image, images. Um, but something you talked about um, when we had chatted was looking at the, the root causes of climate change and cultural alienation and this idea, um, and Antoine touched on bit of just um, economic growth that is the end of all. Um, and, and can you comment a little bit on that in terms of that connecting to your root cause of climate? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think that the idea that humanity is separate from nature is a root cause of climate change. And uh, this can, some people think, goes back to Greek philosophy from Plato and then through Enlightenment philosophy. Descartes, uh, certainly in the Western tradition, it is more prevalent. Um, it also has a lot of religious significance. And where I mentioned before that I work at Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary, and we had this conference in September 2014 is when Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the Climate Summit to engage civil society more in solutions to climate change. And um, so we had this conference of religious leaders to reframe it as a moral issue, galvanize faith-based activism. And the same day that our conference started, there was an article in Science Magazine written by a climate scientist and an economist. And they said, uh, over and above the institutional reforms and policy changes that are needed, we need to reorient our attitude towards nature and thereby ourselves. And I think that, um, and called on more, the moral religious le leaders to do that. Uh, and I think that there is particularly um, within, there's been a lot sort of asserted about Christianity in particular, there is also a lot to say about secular society in this regard. And even the words that we say, environment, climate, makes it seem like it's a backdrop. Um, just, I do believe that the theological roots of this matter, uh, just to give a couple of quick examples. Oh, we're going to come to this. I'll give you time to <laughs> okay. <this> later. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I do think that it's a sense of separation, and um, the and, and this is this is also about sort of the, the, the air we breathe is, is not obviously separate to, and so when you call it phantom risks, when you're talking about whether pollution from chemicals causes health impacts, and some people in the EPA say, we don't we need to roll back regulation, these are phantom risks. Um, it's because there is this idea that we're completely separate and that that's some kind of spooky realm um, that isn't really proven. So I think that that's one of the root causes. And the economic development paradigm grows out of that, where things are counted as, or just considered externalities that affect the backdrop of the natural world, rather than seeing that they go into our bodies immediately. So, you know, one of the things when we're talking about this concept of, of collaborating across borders again and, you know, thinking about this and how do we work together on this issue, we have to work together on this issue, um, as, as we do with so many big issues. So, I, I put the how in, in little brackets, because the question could be how do we move beyond us versus them, but also do we move beyond us versus them. Um, so I'll let you take that as, as you will, um, but I am going to ask Lila to open up again, because I thought something that you had brought up when we chatted that was really important to me was this idea of thinking about these binaries that we set up. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you about a little binary relating to your work um, and your thoughts on that. So you had brought up an example of, um, particularly in, in a lot of the work you do of civilized and uncivilized, but I'll open it up to you to maybe um, chat a bit more about this idea of binaries and why that, that might be important to reevaluate. Huh. 
Um, yeah, I think that binaries um, are created to uh, discern certain things. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with discernment, necessarily. Um, however, the, the, the generation of binaries, the creation of binaries, creates the risk of miscategorizing things and, and, and inappropriately and inaccurately discerning. Um, and so I don't think the binaries are, are bad necessarily. I think they do create space for people to be divided though. Um, and I think they create space for people to be, um, cause often binaries, um, have a, a, a superior and an inferior side. And so, um, it's, it's really conducive to categorizing entire human groups in, as, as inferior. Um, and so I think that's, that's the risk. Um, and so one of the binaries we discussed was the binary of, um, civilized versus uncivilized, and um, <laughs> there's perhaps no greater uh, inaccuracy in labeling indigenous peoples as uncivilized and, and European pirates as civilized. Um, <laughs> but I think I'll, I think I'll uh, epitomize that with a, with a parable or a story. I can actually, I guess, a story because parables are fictional. This is not fictional. Um, one of the things that happened was uh, natural historians said that horses do not exist on this continent before the arrival of the Spanish. Well, they said they did exist, but they all wiped out in the Ice Age. However, um, we have an a indigenous woman who just put out her PhD uh, by the name of Yvette Collin who has shown that there were, in fact, immense horse herds on this continent at the point of Spanish arrival. And so why would there be this Eurocentric myth that horses didn't exist here? Um, the reason is that in Spain, at that time, they had been through 800 years of warfare, and the horse had become a hot commodity, because the more horses you have, the better chances you have winning the war such that only nobility were allowed to own horses. So when the Spanish got here and saw huge, vast herds of horses, uh, all the way from Mexico up what is now called Mexico up to what is now called Canada, um, there's this, you basically have all these people that you're trying to paint as savages running around with horses. And horses in Spain were like BMWs or Mercedes Benz. So it's hard to paint these people as uncivilized if they all, everyone has a Mercedes Benz. And so it got to this point where there was this uh, myth that was generated to um, create this civilized versus uncivilized paradigm. And it's, it's really simple, actually. Um, it was just to justify the genocide of the people. If they're not civilized, then they don't matter. If they're not Christian, then they don't matter. And so, um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that one. But that PhD is available online if you look it up. And I, I think something that, for me, listening to, to you talk about this idea of civilized versus uncivilized, and there's so many other ways we kind of create that comparison um, nowadays, is also where we look for expertise and where we look for knowledge. Because um, if we set it up like that, we're not going to go to that community that we call uncivilized for expert advice. We're going to assume it's all in that other barrel that we've created. So that assumption really blocks us off from so much knowledge, which I'm sure all of you could talk about extensively, and I hope we do. Um, I, Karina, I wanted to move over to you because we're looking at this, like, moving beyond us versus them. And, Something you had, had chatted about was this idea of politics, um, and what does it mean when we say we don't want to get too political these days, which I'm sure all of you have heard somewhere, um, and versus this idea of policy, which we also know, you know, we're coming off of a, a, a climate summit that's important, and policy can play a role in many things that are very important. Um, can you talk a little bit about for you, um, important distinctions between them? Sure. Um, it just takes a second. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. I might take a moment to interpret that cartoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the least partisan cartoon <laughs> about politics, so it would be fine. Yeah, well, actually, it's, it's something that is, has bothered me for a long time when people say, oh, we don't want to get political, or we don't want to say anything political in, in conversations um, and programs. Um, I think that political means it has to do with power. And if we shy away from anything that has to do with power in the decisions that matter, um, well, that's what many people have done. And we now have a situation where 70% of um, the American people are around there support the climate, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, support action on climate, and yet uh, we have the leaders in, in, in the government of Washington holding it back. Um, we have to be able to engage in the democratic process in order to prevent uh, the complete control um, of that, of those corporate interests. Um, so I think that's obvious to many of us here. Um, but I think, is, that, is there something more you wanted me to say on that? <laughs> Not really, but you can add more. Does anyone else want to add to that? An idea of, of, of deciphering between politics and policy? Yeah. I never give up my microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, I talk about politics. I come from come from Washington D.C., uh, so I know everything about polarization and, and, and the lack of bipartisanship uh, at this moment in time. Um, I think that's um, it's an issue. Um, and there's there's uh, very few other issues that's politicized and that's as clearly defined by bipartisan lines as your, your attitude towards uh, towards climate, um, and that's that's really holding up a lot of progress in, in Washington. But there's a lack of uh, trying to reach across the aisle uh, by both sides. And I think there's um, what I often encounter when I speak to uh, to NGOs that are interested in this issue. Um, there's very much a, a lack of interest in reaching out to to uh, the Republican side on these issues. Um, because there is so much that is, is culturally um, culturally different between the two sides, <clears throat> but I think it's it's the one thing that the uh, the environmental movement in the United States needs to figure out is how to how to approach uh, the Republican side of this conversation. Um, we were actually screening a movie in in D.C. at the German Embassy last week. It was not a world premiere; it was only a U.S. premiere because we were screening a documentary on Alaska. Um, that had been shown on German television before. We subtitled it and showed it to the US audience. Um, and it reminded me of my, my trip to Alaska in, in March of this year, um, where I was speaking to um, lots of Republican politicians. Right? Mostly had Republican politicians in, in Alaska. And I found out that it was actually Sarah Palin, during her time as the governor of Alaska, started a climate change task force in Alaska um, because the situation is so very real there. They have islands that are going flooded in, in a decade or two. Uh, they have glaciers that are melting, that are destabilizing um, drinking water, aquifers, um, are destabilizing the very ground they're, they're living on. Um, so there, there are at least um, some places in the United States where the, the, the conversation has crossed that, that, that partisan boundary. And I think that's where, where Washington would need to move. Thank you. And um, another kind of us versus them that I think comes up a lot in the climate conversation is this idea of market approaches and cap working within the capitalist system and revolution, a whole new system that we can't possibly approach it within the system, you know, you can't fix it with a system that broke it type thing. Um, and I, I thought this was a good way to maybe think about it, that we did build this system. But I'm wondering, um, because I feel like maybe with your work, Jackie, you're, you're both working in green job creation and, and looking at those things, but also perhaps working with some communities that see maybe the system isn't working for them. Do you have some ideas on how to navigate those, those sides? Definitely. And um, I wouldn't necessarily characterize this as working on a great job. We're definitely talking about the green economy and, and really how it does need to fundamentally be transformed, as you said. So we um, we do feel like 
all of our systems, our, our, our uh, energy systems, our waste systems, our food systems, our water systems, we need, uh, we need pretty radical transformation because we are in such a, I often go around and I do these talks and 75% of my talks are basically talking about how horrible things are. And so, um, because I really am trying to, and I use a lot of story-based strategy to do that because I am trying to convey to folks that we can't just tweak a fundamentally deeply flawed system um, that we have of, of capitalism, which is really premised on the notion of being winners and losers. I mean, it's capitalizing on our natural resources, capitalizing on people and, and communities in a lot of ways. And so we really are trying to transform how, how, we, um, how our economy is, is run and, um, and the relationship between money and politics. And, um, and really uplifting human rights at, at, at the center and, and, and um, as opposed to, to wealth building at the center it's been a wealth, a wealth building for a, a very small um, a group of people and so that does share similar demographics and so we are um, so we're, we're very very much talking about needing to shift to, to localism local production local localism in general and the need to, to, to get money out of politics so that we don't have folks who are elected to serve the interest of, of, of uh, corporate corporate interests and that we need to have a true, true deep democracy where we're all represented and where, where we're able to be, to, to advance um, self-determination. So we are shifting away from, from a, a utility business model as a way of generating energy, where we have a situation where people can literally get their electricity cut off in, in the dead of winter and not have heat just because they aren't able to pay their electricity bills. People who can get their water shut off, these are things that are essential for life. And the fact that you can actually pay for poverty with your very life in our current system lets us know that we just are so not, you know, that it can't continue the way it is. So. Um, I, um, I think, actually, I'm going to go back. I had a little quote from Lila June here um, that I just thought was so beautiful, it was worth repeating. There's a collection of principles that Western society needs to understand in order to for it to live in a more humble way. And in order to live in a way that regenerates and nourishes instead of exploiting and capitalizing on its fruits. Um, I think there's a lot to think of there. Um, and there's something that I had asked as a follow-up to you and also to Karana, and I, I feel free for all of you to add in. Um, one of the kind of us versus them that I've heard about is this urgency with climate change that we all have to do, you know, all hands on deck, right now, everything we can do. And then there's this other idea of, we have to do an awful lot more listening. We have to, we, there are a lot of people we have not been listening to. So, um, would any of you like to open up, speaking about, again, how do, how do we navigate those, those ideas? I, I think that uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really profound and important point to do more listening. Um, I think interfaith dialogue is an interesting model because people get quickly to their core belief systems. Um, and in the case of, uh, for instance, if you're talking, if there's a Hindu who believes in reincarnation, talking to a Christian who believes in an afterlife in heaven, you get to a different kind of discussion about future generations on earth. Um, if uh, you're talking about um, a, a Judeo-Christian idea of, of this earth as a gift from God to humanity, and you have a, a Dene elder speak of um, the, the water as, as a being, as a spirit, as its own um, agent uh, with volition, then it is a whole other dimension of conversation. So I would say that in the sense of listening to each other, in I think it's important on that deeper level, I think we're in a crisis that, that really is about so much more than getting the, the grid right and um, the balance with, with renewables. Of course, that is so important. But it is also about why are we here on Earth? Um, what is our moral obligation to uh, fellow human beings on the other side of the world? What, for that matter, is our moral obligation to the rest of life beyond humanity? 
so I think that um, those, those kinds of, of listening conversations are very important. I also think, though, that it is so crazy that there's any more fossil fuel build out right now, any more drilling. It's so crazy that we've got to put ourselves into it. There, I know that there are people here working very hard on that. And what I acknowledge that in this audience, we have many people who are on front lines organizing, working so hard in that way. Um, it's a matter of political advocacy, voting, engaging the system. It's a matter of nonviolent civil disobedience in some cases. But we know that two thirds of the known fossil fuel reserves cannot be burned uh, for this planet to be habitable. And the fact that they're opening up the Arctic to drilling and this recent uh, bill that's the so called tax cuts and jobs bill in the Senate, that that was a deal made with Senator Murkowski to open up the Arctic. It's crazy. We can't have an oil spill in the Arctic. We can't burn those reserves, even if we find them. So I just want to say, obviously I'm taking the easy road and saying both. We need to have those deeper conversations, but I do believe that we need to have urgent action and think really creatively about how to do it. Um, and I really want to just uh, tip my hat to those people that are doing that on the front lines. Would anyone else like to add? Um, sure. I just want to share one experience uh, because we talk so much about capitalism and markets and um, how, how they affect all of this conversation. And uh, having having lived in that different world, having having worked in, in finance, an industry that um, might have had some reason for humility in, in 2008 when I was there, but clearly didn't. Um, I was I was positively surprised by an experience I had last week in, in DC also um, at, a, at a talk by Bob Murray. And Bob Murray is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in this room know this, um, is that the CEO of uh, Murray Energies, uh, one of the largest coal companies here in the United States. And he was, uh, he was very optimistic about the, the, the regulatory environment in the United States going forward. Uh, but he, he finished his talk um, with uh, a, a disappointment for him um, that for the first time in his career, and this is a uh, man who is, uh, who is in his 70s. For the first time in his career, he had not been able to find financing for a project that he planned. Um, so this is a coal project that he wanted to start in the United States. And for the very first time, he said, uh, there's no money for this on the international financial markets. And it's because of a divestment movement. It's because of a lot of, uh, a lot of financial <laughs> investors who are maybe not showing humility, but who are thinking smartly about the future, who are accepting that there is a risk to some of these investments. And that's, we can deregulate any way you want. You can open up any, 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 any natural reserve for, for drilling, uh, um, mining, whatsoever. Um, if, if we're able to, to dry up the investments going into these fossil fuel resources, and it's happening, um, then you know, all of that deregulation all of that uh, potential destruction doesn't have to become real destruction. Um, that that um, mentioning of divestment, I think, also brings up a point that uh, speaks to your question. As like, once we're done divesting and we're done um, investing in, in fossil fuels, um, then what do we do? Because a lot of us at this point um, are dependent on these things for our transportation, not only of ourselves, but of everything we wear, everything we eat, um, everything in our houses, all of our electronics, the way we harvest elect uh, raw materials for electronics. Um, so this question of, yes, urgent action is needed to divest, but then we get to the point of like, oh shoot, what do we do now? Um, and, and we realize that what the ancestors are asking for is nothing except for the wholesale transformation of everything we do. That's all. Um, so then we, then we get into the listening part, right? Of like, okay, who knows how to live in a sustainable way? And there are many cultures around the world who have not only lived in one place for thousands and thousands of years without destroying it, but um, have lived in those places and regenerated it and, and nourished it. Um, and so I think that's where the listening part comes in, is asking these uh, cultures, how do we live? 
And, and one of those things is to, to trust that what the earth gives you on her, on her surface is enough and that everything we need is in the palm of her hand and everything we need to survive is available within our local region. What if we all live with that understanding in mind that everything we need to live is in this local region if we know how to touch the earth again? And there are ways to harvest from the earth that don't destroy her but actually regenerate her. And these regenerative ecological practices are not going to be relearned by living in New York City, I'm sorry. It's, it, we can't interact with nature and live in this way um, for, for much longer. And so there's this idea of returning to the earth um, doesn't mean you have to lose convenience or comfort. I think that's a huge misconception that sustainability and comfort are mutually exclusive. Uh, they're not. There's ways to live close to the earth that are comfortable and with sanitation and everything you need. And you don't need to destroy the earth to have your basic needs fulfilled. So we really won't be losing anything. But I think listening to these communities and, and more and more I've been starting to feel like we are, have become slaves to capitalism, slaves to an unsustainable lifestyle, and indigenous cultures are our Harriet Tubman, and we, are, we as indigenous peoples and, and other cultures around the world, uh, it's our task to start generating this underground railroad and getting our people out of this lifestyle, because let's face it, we don't know how to live without destroying the earth yet, but we can learn how to do so, we need to. For you to start thinking of, we have our first audience participation, and we're running a little behind, so we're going to cut it to five minutes. But here is your challenge with hearing all of the stuff we're talking about, because we want to also, there's so much knowledge and experience in the room, very diverse experience. It's give you five minutes to turn to someone around you that you don't know, and to discuss how could you work together on climate change? How could you actually collaborate with someone you don't know in this room? Um, and we're going to ask you, if you're willing to, take a little selfie and post it with the hashtag Human Impacts Institute uh, to whatever social media outlet you prefer um, so that we document it for all eternity, for everyone in the world to know that you're, you're going out on this limb and, and learning how to collaborate with others. So we're going to give you five minutes, we're going to lift the lights up, and then we're coming on back and we have our next amazing performance. And we can take a little break up here. And I will start the clock. If I can. Yeah. <laughs>
out names. I'm, I'm such a teacher. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so glad it was hard to get you to stop collaborating. That's totally what we're here for. Um, and you're going to have much more time to chat, so don't worry. So, our next amazing performer is Angel Nefis, and I would love to just hand it right over to her. Welcome. strikes me as, as poignant that there needs to be that meeting in the middle. Um, and something that helps me as a, a maker and an artist is, is what it means to decentralize human beings. <laughs> For, and that, that is like a very concrete idea that, that helps me sort of think about what is happening to the planet, what's happening with climate change. Um, and so when I was in this, ge I was in my undergrad course, I was in this you know, geology course and the teacher said that if we kept going the way that we were going, and you correct me if this is wrong, because I truly do not know. So if we keep going this way, you know, my thought is that the world will be mostly, if not all, water, and it will be so polluted that what will be left to survive is like very large jellyfish. <laughs> and the girl next to me was like, that's so sad. And I was kind of like, is it? And you're like, this is what we did. <laughs> Maybe if we keep going this way, we need to let jellyfish have a chance to see what they do. So decentralized in that way, thinking about all things as beings that are deserving of honor and sustainability, and not just us, but not just animals, but sort of thinking of plants and airs and, and, and tree and the mud and cement, everything as a being sort of worthy, an animal that is worthy. So that's where that came from. Climate, the earth the beast. It can be an abstract thing to think of it, a floating pack of ice, three or four meters thick, covering the Earth's North Pole. How if all the ice covering Antarctica, Greenland, and in mountain glaciers were to melt, sea level would rise at least 70 meters, which is about three-fourths the size of the Statue of Liberty. How if that happens, the ocean would cover all coastal cities, the land area would shrink drast drastically, and when I ask Madam Google, what does that mean? She tells me, many cities will survive, such as Denver. <laughs> and this alarms me, Denver? All Denver <laughs> shade aside, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready for everything I love as I know it, to drown or be incinerated or wilt slowly, sickly under the weight of half-long winters. I am 29, an English major, an MFA candidate in a poetry program in the South, which is also abstract. And I read on an average at least 15 poems a week. I write critical analyses on Gwendolyn Brooks, Robert Hayden, Louise Gluck, and all their poems are filled with the flourish of flowers that won't be there without bees. Hear me out. I am told 
Environment is just where you live your life. I live my life in the folds of books with my goofy orange tabby cat sleeping beneath my desk, an animal not ferocious, as real and deserving as myself, I think, and how many things on and in and above the earth are animals in a way. So many things. I'm not a scientist. I barely floss. But oh, it helps my poet self, my late for work self, my gotta pay rent self to slow down and separate the plastic from the paper when I'm in a rush, to think of the animal of it all, ferocious or friendly, the brain and undulating pink of coral reef, both home and animal, its easy sway, amniotic, a song that maybe I knew when I lived in my mother, its tendrils of tongue, its trillion mouths, a hive of tasting, insane, a window to the past, its limestone skeleton delivering messages, and oh, the hard knife of acid and bleach hardening it to a sad husk. It's easy to imagine the majestic forest turned wicks of furious drought, of plague and dryness, how it reduces pine's ability to make sap, to roll out the sticky red carpet of juice to protect itself, and then how the animal of the fire climbs and climbs unquenchable. How now, too, the animal of the smoke, its reach and cruel, boundless, a thousand dark wings in the air, the endless, endless blue belly of the sea, infamous, glistening gut, its tattered shawls all waving and waving, its high hiss of froth, and oh, the constant rising of the sea, the drowning of the wetlands from the northern Washington to southern California, oh, mouthless earth, tell me what it is you know, or else you have told me, and I have not listened, and where will we go, and what will we tell our children or the mirror, and let's talk about the mirror, and ourselves, and our children, our parents, our neighbors. Let's talk about who is disproportionately affected. Where is waste stored? Where is it disposed? And who is disposable? I know what time it is, they say. Time to vote, time to read, to listen, to open a pop-up shop and bring folks from the margins to the center. Time to make buildings sustainable and resilient. Time to collaborate across borders, they say. Make sister neighborhoods instead of sister cities. No more separate and never equal. No canary in the coal mine. Time to combine our expertise. What if I told you a black, queer, poet, born in Chicago, raised in Michigan, living in New York, daughter of a janitor who dropped out of eighth grade, wrote a poem about the animal of our beast planet. What if she read it to a room full of people as varied and wild as the forest? Folks who know it's time to face facts, get less emotional, alliance is necessity and weapon. Come now, friends, scientists, teachers, anthropologists, lobbyists, florists, artists, ex-inmates, fellow heartbeat havers, makers of waste and magic on this here crust of the only earth, beast animal. Let us add our action. Um, was this idea of civic engagement. 
Um, and this is actually a photo of uh, many women that recently won election and ran for election that might not have usually run or might have not have been able to run in the past. Um, and Donnell, who wasn't able to make it tonight for a family emergency, um, had also <laughs> talked about this idea of people, power, and political will. So Karina, with this idea of how do we win on climate, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts of why civic engagement is such an important thing? <laughs> Sure. Um, well, I think that I mean, first of all, we we have to we know that there are changes in consciousness that need to happen. Um, we know that there are changes in consumer choices and the marketplace, but we need to change laws and policies too, and and that is done through our elected representatives, and we can make an impact. Uh, and it's not going to be a perfect choice. A lot of us have felt disillusioned with politics um, for many reasons. Um, certainly the influence of money, which Jackie mentioned, is, is absolutely no joke and is part of the process. Um, but it, I mean, we, we simply have to, in order to have the votes in the Senate and the votes in the House, to um, be able to, to counter uh, the incredible power of this lobby in Washington. It is just the <laughs> legacy political power of this dying industry that is holding the whole world back in this country. I mean, we're the only country not to be part of the Paris Agreement, um, although we can't be officially withdrawn until the day after the next election, which is good. But, um, but anyway, so um, I just don't think as, as many problems as our democracy has, we, we, we've got to give it a try. <laughs> and um, and that's, that's, that's just you know, one answer to the question. Um, I think one of the things that, that I love that I'm going to quote you, um, you said sometimes we just have to suck it up and do it. <laughs> well, um, I do think that there's a lot of complaining um, in sort of our culture uh, because it's such a bad situation. First of all, we have to deal with the layer of the, the media and people living in alternate realities. So I think that one way in which we win is to um, change the, the conversation uh, and to, to elevate it and to do that, and it's good to do that within the political process, to um, put it to candidates, to make it the issue. And, uh, and so campaigns are also conversations. Um, it's not just about the end result and who wins, uh, but it is also a conversation. It's our chance to talk about this issue and why it matters to us. So to engage on that level is important too. And um, Anton, I'm gonna, there are a lot of pictures up here, but um, particularly the C40 Cities one over in the corner. Um, you were in Bonn, um, no? Or you know a lot about what happened in Bonn then. <laughs> um, in the recent climate, international climate negotiations, and something that you had talked about was this idea of taking climate diplomacy to another space and looking at this idea of how cities and regions and states um, particularly in the U.S. right now, in the face of, of you know, our national um, stance, uh, are are playing a new role. Can you can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So I, I wasn't in Bonn myself. I was preparing Bonn for um, a number of U.S. delegations, the official U.S. delegation, but also the delegations from California, Virginia, Washington State, Oregon were all represented on their governor's level. Um, a lot of other states were represented at uh, Secretary for the Environment level, and we had a number of U.S. cities that were represented uh, with the mayor or, or other staff. And this is something new that we've never really seen at this level at, at one of these conferences before, right? So originally this was um, a bunch of diplomats in a room and negotiating emissions targets. Um, and that uh, were so so until 2015 when we had the, the really seminal Paris Agreement. But for the first time, we <coughs> together, as Brenna just said, every country on this planet. So the developed world and the developing world came together and said, "We together have to take um, have to take action. We are responsible for this planet." Um, and something that is happening now is that it's not only at the national level, but that in Bonn we actually have two zones. Uh, so we had the, the official uh, negotiation zone um, where you had um, German delegation, and U.S. delegation, etc. And we had the, uh, the bond zone, as it was called, where you had all the, the non-state, the subnational actors. And this is where the, the businesses came um, 
to show what they were doing. Uh, this is where the mayors came to see what, what actions they were taking. And this is where a lot of NGOs came also to, to show what, uh, what they thought needed to be done in the adaptation space, but also in the mitigation space. And I think this is where, where climate diplomacy is, is going to go in the future. And developments here in the United States are very much pushing us there. Uh, when you have um, a national government that's taking a state back, uh, taking a step back, uh, but at the same time you have state, local uh, business leaders who are, who are still going ahead, who are taking more steps, who are progressing along with the rest of the world, um, and they are asking for for space in this progress and in this in this process. And that's what we see happening right now. We will see it happening even more next year. Uh, when um, the governor of California has invited the world to join a political climate action summit in San Francisco, <coughs> which will be exclusively devoted to the work of, of non-state actors. So interesting to see that, you know, from something that for many people working in climate, but it's such a, such a negative setback on the federal level, is really in a way creating new spaces at the table for people we haven't been able to necessarily hear from or to step up. Um, and Jackie, I wanted to come over to you in terms of some of the work that you've been doing. Um, there are a lot of numbers about how many new jobs are being created from renewable energies up there. Um, but something that you are working at the NAACP so much on is advancing energy efficiency and clean energy in creative ways and with people we haven't always thought of as leading on climate. So I'm wondering if you can expand on that in the terms of this idea of winning on climate. Yeah. So. I, mean, I certainly consider us to be winning on climate when that last coal mine is closed, when that last coal plant has been retired, when that last oil well has been sealed, when that last rig has been docked, and so forth. And so with that, in order to get there, we really do need to, we, we waste 80% of the energy that we generate. So energy efficiency for us is critical in terms of let's, let's, let's uh, reduce the demand for energy in the first place. Um, we also consider um, of course, advancing, really defining what clean energy is, because a lot of even the ways that we define clean energy now aren't necessarily clean when you talk about cradle to grave processes. So we're really making sure that we're being very intentional and, de and deliberative and thorough about defining clean energy and then advancing those. But first and foremost, really reducing the amount of energy we need, we need in the first place. And this is what, which brings us back to this whole notion of localism right now. We, 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 in order to have kiwi all year round, in order to have all these different things that we want, we're, we're shipping and we're trucking and we're so forth with our food system. In order to, in, instead of recycling food at its source, at, at, at recycling waste at its source, we, we're trucking. Alabama alone receives uh, waste from 26 states. And think of all the energy that's used to, to do that trucking and not to mention the communities that end up host to those landfills and those incinerators where that waste is processed. So really, for us, um, winning on climate means that we are that we are are changing are changing all of these systems in a way that is more sustainable and less harmful um, and to our to the communities and to the, to the planet to, to nature. And something, and Karen, I cut you off right at the beginning, beginning <laughs> about talking about examples of how interfaith dialogues and coming together. Um, and how faith and wisdom traditions can really have, have a lot to offer in this conversation. Um, and I'm wondering if you can now share some of those examples of how um, some of those conversations of, of different faiths coming together are helping us move, move forward on climate. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think I would first say that um, my definition of faith and spirituality and religion is quite broad. Um, and I know actually because Tara, you, you were at our Religions for the Earth conference as, a, as an atheist or agnostic, yeah. um, if I recall. Humanist. I don't know. I don't know the label, but yeah, I was, I was a not, not part of a religion panelist at a faith. <laughs> yeah, it was a wonderful invitation, thank you. Well, the idea is belief systems. Um, they exist uh, even among people who are not uh, members of, of, of faith communities per se. Um, I think it was, you know, certain people have expressed this notion that, that you worship something, that in, in Emerson among them, um, that you, uh, in, there's always an ultimate concern um, that, that comes forward in, in people's lives based on how, what they're accountable to, what they reveal. 
And so in our secular society, um, which I don't think it's not based on, um, on any kind of religious notions. I think it's based on a certain distortion of a Judeo-Christian notion of anthropocentrism, um, a distorted interpretation of dominion, uh, that only human beings matter, and then also this economic development paradigm that says that it's just brought products bought and sold are more important than um, human dignity, uh, than you know, the, the, the state of the natural world. So I just want to say that. Um, obviously there have been uh, really beautiful statements from Pope Francis, from Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, um, from the Dalai Lama, from many major religious leaders, and also statements from denominations and from uh, the Hindu Declaration on Climate Change, the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change. These things are important. They're important resources for people who want, who want to look and see about what that faith or wisdom tradition has to offer, certain concepts that are, that are beautiful to help us to think about and grapple with and process uh, this crisis. So I, I, do, I do recommend it on that level, um, but I also really think that we ought to question what it means to be secular. Because when money is held up as the be-all, end-all of measuring the value of anything, that itself is a kind of religion. When a so-called invisible hand is seen to be guiding things in a way that we just can't quite understand the justice of it, uh, but we should have faith in it, but yet we have all these people um, living and struggling in poverty and the wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, and we have our forests, our oceans, all being uh, just prey to the system, that is a kind of cult, in a way. And so I think we live in a, in a highly charged um, value system that we need to actually participate in and correct. And Lila, I want to give you an opportunity here. Um, I, I just realized, I feel like I just like wrote down so many amazing quotes from you, and I, I probably shouldn't quote you since you're sitting next to me. So um, I, I, I'm going to just open it up. I had a quote, but I'm not going to read. Um, of any of you have additional thoughts? Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, how do we win on climate? Um, yeah. Well, I've been thinking a lot about um, various uh, medicinal sciences around the world and throughout time, and particularly um, Eastern medicine, as in uh, South Asian medicine, as well as uh, other medicinal practices around the world, including uh, my tribal practice of medicine. Um, there's this really interesting concept that I think is um, different than what we're used to hearing about illness and healing. And it's this idea that um, your illness is your gift. Um, it is your messenger. Um, for instance, if you don't sleep ever or eat well, like I haven't been for a few weeks, um, you get you get a you get a, a, a head cold. You start to get a raw throat. You get a cough, and you have to go to sleep. <laughs> and so the 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 flu or the cold or whatever it is I've obtained is my messenger is saying, hey, you are going too fast, too often, and you're not nourishing yourself. And I get sick at least twice a month these days because I'm working really hard like all of us are. And so this messenger is telling me, and if I don't listen to it soon, <laughs> it could get even worse, that my lifestyle is not working. It, it needs to change. And so um, similarly, I've been looking at climate change as a, as a symptom, as a gift, as a messenger, saying the way we're living is not working. It's out of balance, something needs to change. And sometimes these hurricanes, these fires, these droughts, these floods, are these great, humongous gifts that give us the courage to change when nothing else will. And so, how do we live, win on climate? I think the way we win is that we love ourselves, love each other, and, and <laughs> and have the audacity and the courage to, to blaze new trails. Because the, the, the trail we're on now, as Winona LaDuke has said, is, 
There, there will be a worn path and there will be an overgrown green path. And the worn path will lead to destruction and the overgrown green path will lead to harmony. The path we know isn't working. I think it's safe to say that. Well, that means a new path needs to be a forged, um, or rather a path so old that it's new. And so, um, in, in that sense, I'm not afraid of climate change. I, I, I'm grateful for it, because it's this huge flu of the planet instructing us to change the way we're living and, and the way that we interact with each other and with Himana Hassan, our, our Mother Earth. So that's how I feel we went. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, the next question I'm going to pose, and I'm going to, because we're running a little um, behind the time and I want to have time for questions is really um, something that quite a few of you had brought up of this idea of movements and the work that all of us are engaged in. It takes, it takes a lot of time. There's been a lot of work in generations before us that have been working on these issues. But there are also sparks, and we can create sparks, and we don't always know what those sparks are that catalyze the sudden tilt where, where, where movements really, you know, we see them come alive. Um, you know, we see major shifts. So, um, my last question for this panel before we open it up to questions from everyone is this idea of how do we engage more people in order to, you know, up the chances of those catalyst moments? Because we don't know what they are, but we can up the numbers. And I want to show you, because I always like to throw a little bit of comedy in here, is I want to, and um, you're going to just see me fast forward a bunch of stuff that we're behind. Um, this one film that I feel like exemplifies my goal on climate change, um, and I think I'll just leave it, at, I mean, in a funny way. I'll leave it at that. This is where I want us to end up. In the dark. <laughs> I think I pressed the wrong button. Can you turn the light back on? Shake when we 
take the time to pray. Um, I think I owe my whole life to prayer, uh, having been a, a survivor of Stanford University and the, the culture of abuse that exists there for women, and a survivor of drug addiction and all kinds of things. Um, prayer really uh, brought me out of, of, of everything that I've ever been through. And um, those darkest moments, that's another gift that these catastrophes give us is sometimes when you, you get brought to your knees, the only place to look is up. You know, that's a common phrase and this idea that, that, it, that it's, we're surrendering, we're coming to a place of surrender um, where we are asking for divine help and, and asking for divine inspiration and asking for divine uh, support. And um, for any people who um, have doubt that that support exists, uh, I would challenge you to experiment with prayer and see what happens because every time I've done it, it's, it's really, really um, brought things to a whole other level that I was not expecting. And being open to seeing what those answers are. Um, so that's always been the catalyst in a lot of our creation stories and a lot of our historical stories. The change comes when the people are humble enough to pray for help. So that, that's my two cents. And son, you oh. no, um, I would say uh, that going to be in solidarity with people who are experiencing the impact of climate change and the impact of the extractionist industry, if more people can go out of their um, way to go and to go to these places and to talk with these people and listen to these communities. Um, I think more will change very quickly. And I say this um, wanting to acknowledge in particular um, people I share the stage with. Uh, Standing Rock was a huge moment for, for this movement. Lila, June, spent a lot of time at Standing Rock. Um, uh, seeing the way that the Standing Rock Sioux reframed the whole issue of climate change by saying uh, water is life, we're water protectors, we're protectors, not protesters. Uh, defend the sacred um, was a, a stunning thing for, for those of us who've seen this movement in circles with the language and not knowing how to get to that point. Seeing the people that, um, that, that gave everything they had to be there and live in community that way. Um, so I just want to, to acknowledge that. I, just want, I also want to say with Jackie Patterson, this, you, this woman does so much for this movement. Um, and has been for so long in these communities uh, listening and serving um, people who are impacted by extractionist industries. Um, and I have just had a little window into her world, for instance, when we were in North Carolina together and, um, and we were with people affected by coal ash in, in saying that, you know, they've been told that high asthma and cancer rates, that they've been told that, can, that it runs in their family. Um, that's why everybody in their family had cancer, not because they all happen to live right next to the flood. So if more people um, go to those areas, listen to them, stand with them very quickly, because also it takes away one of the biggest arguments in, in, in the most distorted lies of the fossil fuel industry, which is this is somehow an elite concern, which is still in the way that they will frame it. They're fighting poverty, that they're fighting poverty by developing fossil fuels and, and, and giving access to energy. So for all those reasons and more, I would just say that would be that would be my way to create those catalytic moments. I think one of those moments you created here today by involving kids, right? You and you was that um, you then decided to uh, see us as the guests of honor right in front of the kids and seeing me in front of the kids. I think it was. Uh, not doing justice to the kid and its involvement in the great movie that we, we, we saw before. So education and, and really uh, educating a generation that will be, will be fighting um, against, against climate change is, is important in creating a learning environment that is, is lead free, that is knock free, etc. And then teaching kids um, about sustainability. Because what we have is very much a, genera a generational issue, right? We have a, uh, when you ask, um, about attitudes towards climate change. Uh, it's an issue that is very much on the mind of the young, 
and that is slightly less on the mind of the, the older generations that then go to vote, which creates issues. Um, something else um, that we've done in, in, in Bonn, or that um, really uh, Fiji did in Bonn, uh, was to involve those communities that are immediately affected, that are affected right now, and that will be tremendously affected if climate change continues. Um, so the conference in Bonn was actually not hosted by Germany, but it was hosted by the government of Fiji in Bonn. And they decided it'd be easier to bring 25,000 people to, to Bonn than it was to, to bring those to Fiji. Also, from an emissions standpoint, we had an emissions free conference, it would have been a lot harder to do in Fiji. Um, but the government of Fiji being, being involved in this process and alerting us to the risk that an entire nation faces there, um, I think creates, creates that kind of interaction. In the same way that refugees from Puerto Rico, um, who are now coming to the state of New York, the state of Florida, etc. And um, also refugees from incidents that have been amplified by, by climate change. Um, the refugees in, uh, that we've seen in Germany coming from Syria are refugees that have been, have been fleeing from events, again, whose risks are amplified by, <coughs> by, by climate change. So really engaging with these communities, um, I think, is also something that will bring the, the, communi uh, the conversation forward. Jackson, did you want to comment as well? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I think similar to what others were saying, I think it's really about connecting people, um, of, and certainly the, the synergy that arises from from trans local organizing, connecting um, community to community, so that communities who are sharing common ground, um, communities that might be inspired by other communities that are maybe farther along in a process than they are. So, I've seen magic happen when a community that's maybe in the in the depths of being a, 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 in a cancer cluster or, or, or whatever, experiencing and feeling powerless, then they connect with another community that was a cancer cluster or that, or that is kind of on the other side of removing the toxins for the, from their community, or I mean a community that is safe, uh, suffering from food insecurity, and then that community then connects with another community that has developed a whole network of local food gardens and they, they see how that path happens. And so that the, the spark from, from seeing someone else who, who's been able to, under similar circumstances, move to the vision that a community might hold for itself. You can see the pathway for getting there. There's been a lot of, of magic that's happened there. I've also seen where folks who have found common ground across unlikely circumstances, one of the more moving conversations I've had was when we did this whole Katrina to Copenhagen thing, where we were talking about hurricane. It was a gathering of women and it was right before the, the Copenhagen Com uh, 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 Climate Conference. And um, this one woman who was from the Louisiana Bayou Keepers, she, uh, a white woman with the Louisiana Bayou Keepers, and she talked about how she could see common ground with the uh, Somali pirates, which were really you know, in the news at that time, because she could see common ground with someone who was really dependent on the water for their livelihoods, and they feel it threatened. And they feel, you know, they they don't feel they feel this level of desperation that they do things that they never would have imagined that they would have done. And she said she could find herself in that kind of situation and where she was. But yet in that gathering of women, women were coming up with remedies uh, in, in, across similar circumstances. So again, just finding common ground in unlikely circumstances and finding a pathway out of circumstances has been, yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. questions here, but then we're going to turn on the lights, bring out some food and more drinks, and you guys can just talk with everyone. And we'll also close the stage portion with um, a performance from Lila June. Um, so does anyone um, have any questions? Uh, we'll have one of, our, one of our climate kids. Can you project really loud? And I'll try to repeat the question if that's all right. what adults are doing and what they can do, but we talked about what parents can do with climate education and teachers, but we didn't talk more about what kids can do in child activism. So what can we do more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bit, um, thank you, younger brother. Um, I think that, uh, a lot of 
young people and kids are taught that that they're not the bosses of the world or they're not powerful in the world. Um, but what I've found is that the exact opposite is true. And in, in the Lakota tradition, the word for child is wakanyeja, which means a uh, holy being. And so we really recognize children as, as messengers and as drivers of change because at the end of the day, when we look at our, into our children's eyes, that's what motivates us to, to, to change, right? That love for our children is one of the, the most powerful drivers of, of social change there is. But what I really want to say is that kids are not less powerful than adults. They are more powerful, I would say. Because when a child opens their mouth to speak and expresses themselves and advocates for something that they believe in, the whole room stops. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? When a young person, a child, stands up and says what they know is true, everyone stops and listens. Partly because they weren't expecting such profoundness to come from a child, but partly because something inside of them knows that if their own child is, is telling them something that's wrong, that they are deeply motivated to change. And so I would say, if we want to talk about what can kids do to uh, positively influence climate change, keep speaking, my little brother. Keep talking. Keep expressing yourself. And keep praying for venues and platforms where your voice can be heard. And Creator will give you those platforms and will give you those ven venues. And when you speak, do it not for fame and do it not for money and have no fear, but do it for your people who are all people and do it for the earth. That's what I would uh, probably recommend. I have a feeling all of our young people in the audience are going to have a lot more uh, venues to share. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give uh, Rowan also the next question. Can you stand up? What do you think is the answer? To upgrade our technology or go back to um, other lifestyles, the like our earlier lifestyles. <laughs> Remember those faces from the video? We just got them. We're like, oh, yeah. oh, that's a tough one. This is probably just a good answer. I can start on that one. Um, I don't think it's either or. So I'm, uh, you're representing Germany, a nation of 81 million people. So they're probably not all planning to go back to the lifestyles of the uh, 10th century uh, BC. Um, probably wouldn't be feasible also uh, for that, that amount of people. Um, and I think so we definitely need to upgrade our technology. Um, but I think it's, it, it goes both. So I think a lot of, a lot of what technology has enabled us to become is, is lazy. And that, that laziness is not healthy, right? So I mean, if I have the choice to, to drive an SUV to work, uh, to work or to, to ride my bike, then maybe the bike is a technology that's slightly older than the SUV, that's actually better for myself. And it's also better for society, because if we are um, a, a nation of people that cycle to work, teaches us a lot more about each other than if we are a nation that, that drives in, in SUVs to work. Uh, so when I move to, uh, wherever I decide to move, I try to uh, move to a place where I'm able to bike to everywhere I go. And right now that means that I'm biking next to a lot of SUVs. Um, <laughs> but I hope that, that that changes over time. And it's, uh, it's about setting examples and you know, it's something that kids can do as well as, as anybody else. Thought you would... <laughs> well, I just I think that's a great question, and basically I agree. So I don't have too much to add. I just wanted to say that um, I think we need to, to right now. There's a little over reliance on the idea that technology will save us. So I guess I would emphasize that going back to to old ways that are living in harmony um, with nature, as has been mentioned before, seeing what you need locally um, and living within your means, the kind of hyper-commodification and consumerism of our, of our society, which 
is a lot of times people measure the success as to whether products are being bought and sold, and that's thrown away, bought and sold and thrown away. So we need to change that measure of success, go back more to the old ways. On the other hand, there are a couple of things with technology. One of them is battery storage, like to store the solar energy. Because I get, I, what I've heard is that enough energy comes from the sun every single day to power the global economy for a year. Is that right? Anyway. <laughs> anyway, something like that. But we don't yet have, we have what we need to, to, to switch to renewable energy, don't get me wrong. But we get a little bit better on the batteries, so it's cheaper for people, so that more people can afford it. So there are certain things about technology that are important too. So, you... Biomimicry for technical innovation is huge to think about. Biomimicry. Yeah, so mimicking the earth systems in technology. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, so bringing the two together, it's not neither, again, like the binaries we were talking about before, it's not necessarily either or. And let's keep talking about that. You mind? And if, I, we actually don't have time for more questions up here, and I'd love to we'll get the follow-up. Make sure you come up afterwards, okay? Um, so I want to thank all of you so much, and all of you for being a part of this conversation. to be, be in this room with all of you. And um, we started with inspiration. I think we explored a lot of um, conversation that for me was very inspirational. And I'd love to invite you to close this portion of the evening with some more words. Yep, great. And we can, we'll, we'll get off the stage. Okay, okay. I'm just gonna grab one. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Can you give a hand for Tara? especially for this event, so, you. Um, <clears throat> the borders between you and me would disappear if you could only see that no carbon dioxide in the sky. It's a crisis of relationship, a crisis of the spirit inside. And until we break down the borders that exist within the mind, we won't be human beings. We'll be too busy picking sides. I don't believe in the lines drawn between cowboys and Indians. I believe that the mother is our earth, and we are all her children. The racial borders built between black and white, women and men, are breaking humanity apart when we could be busy building. That doesn't mean to ignore the past or maintain the status quo. It means to raise up the valleys of poverty and make the mountains of wealth low. Neither does this mean to write off the oppressors and leave them alone. It means praying for their souls and believing that they can grow. I woke up today to offer the world a rose, to offer the audacity to try within a world, of, within a world without hope. Forgiveness is the key that opens up paths to feeling 
So I hand you the Jubilee, and we commit ourselves to healing. The borders between you and me would disappear if you could only see that no amount of gold is worth a single heartbeat and no boundary can split the sea. In the stories of my people, a woman once came. The children were suffering, and they knelt down to pray. She gave them a key lesson about how to live again. She taught them to heal the connection between women and men. This border between the genders that hurts and harms our hearts can be healed when we place women at the center from the start. Patriarchy sears our skin like a boundary between the soul, and it hurts the men just like it has hurt billions of women untold. And now the men measure their worth by how much land they can own, just like they're taught to measure their worth by how many women they can hold. But women have a spirit, have a voice and needs just like the sky is blue. And Mother Earth has a spirit and a voice and her own needs too. We heal our precious young men who wander the earth without a compass by recognizing and healing the past, which is drowned and mothers burned. And until we train our young boys how to redefine what manhood means, we will be doomed to the same business that has ransacked the earth. The borders between you and me will disappear if you could only see that no amount of gold is worth a single heartbeat and no human boundary can split the sea. I think that we think that we are drawing real lines, but don't you see that these borders only exist inside our minds? I don't believe in America, Canada, or Mexico, but I believe in the birds that fly and the rivers that ebb and flow straight across those lines that were drawn by colonial desires to benefit extractive empires. And so let us all break down the window panes that separate us from the wind. Let us break down the city walls that keep us from the river bends. We've come to live in boxes that divorce us from the earth. And now kids can name more corporate logos than they can name seeds in the dirt. And this is all because they've been Cajun capitalism watching smartphones since birth. It's time for us to find a beautiful life beyond what we know. Winona Luduk says, one path is worn, and one path is overgrown. And the path we tread for 500 years has left us all feeling mournful. And now it is time to reimagine everything and question what we were taught is normal. The borders between our hearts and the truth of the Earth's sanctity are burning us into a cage of arrogance and insanity. We are not God, and the time has finally come that we learn this the hard way and realize what we have done. The earth is so forgiving, and we have another chance to try to be humble children of hers and not masters of space and time. So we walk gently to the river's edge and cast our prayers upon the waters. I believe in you, and I believe in me to open our hearts and break down the borders. The borders between you and me would disappear if you could only see that no amount of gold is worth a single heartbeat and no human boundary
You guys are wonderful. I hope you have a beautiful night, and thanks for letting me be a part of this. And, uh, blessings to all of you, and safe travels home, family. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for being a part of this evening. I think this is a wonderful way um, to get close to the end of this calendar year. Um, and to think about how we can really come together. So I hope we'll continue the conversation. We're bringing out food and more drinks. And, um... And, um, yeah, thank you so much.